Hi everybody, welcome to this Timeline documentary. My name is Dan Snow and here I am in a Lancaster bomber cockpit, one of the few remaining Lancasters from the Second World War, to tell you about my new history channel. It's called History Hit, it's like Netflix for history. Hundreds of history documentaries on there and interviews with many of the world's best historians. Follow the information below this film or just search online for History Hit and make sure you use the code TIMELINE to get a special introductory offer. Now enjoy this show. Two years ago, a couple of local archaeologists stumbled on this, a vast, undiscovered earthwork hidden here in these Herefordshire woods. They thought it could be man-made, even prehistoric, but they got really excited when they discovered this aerial photo, which appears to show a large curve here in the snow, which is in this field adjacent to the forest. And they wondered if the bank and ditch there might be linked to the curve here, except the two features are 500 metres apart. If they're at opposing ends of one big structure encircling this entire hilltop, then the archaeologists believe they found one of the largest Iron Age monuments in all Britain. But are they right? We've got just three days to find out. Our site is here in rural Herefordshire. Dinmore Hill is a vast promontory flanked by escarpments to the north and south and surrounded on three sides by the wonderfully named River Lug. And it's the setting for a curious puzzle. We were up here in the winter surveying through this woodland and uh, we came across this way and came up to this big bank here. As the county archaeologist discovered, there's something mysterious lurking in these woods. You can see, then, a huge ditch. But well, that's there. not all, is it? Well, <clears throat> we went back to the office and looked at the records that we had, and further along here, uh, there's a, what looks like a big bank and ditch on the outside there, too. And you reckon this could all be Iron Age? Well, it's certainly of the right scale. It's a massive earthwork, massive bank, ditch on the outside. Have you noticed that in the ditch there's an ex-president of the Council of British Archaeology? Francis, you've been poking around in there for some time. Do you think this could be an Iron Age hill fort? Well, the scale's certainly right, Tony. But the thing is, hill fort means almost anything. It could be about soldiers, um, it could be a communal centre, it could be a village, it could even be a large cattle corral. But, of course, that begs the question, is it Iron Age? Well, exactly. And that's the other thing, Tony. I mean, some of these hilltop enclosures could be up to 6,000 years old. Keith, what other information have we got about this site? Has any other archaeology been done? None. Any survey work? None. So, apart from an aerial photo and an old ditch and your assertion that it could be Iron Age, really... This dig could be about any period in history, couldn't it? Well, that's life. That's time, Team Francis. <laughs> well, that fills me with confidence. This site feels suspiciously like the lucky dip at the archaeological fun fair. Still, Iron Age hill fort. At least we know what we're looking for. The purpose of hill forts is the subject of heated debate, but they do at least all have one or two things in common. A set of vast earthworks in one continuous circuit, usually with a couple of entrances and some houses or storerooms inside. So, if we've got one here, it shouldn't be hard to miss. Except this site is more than 40 acres. It's huge. We've got our work cut out just surveying it, which is why John's recruited a small army of geophysics boffins to lend a hand. And there's no hanging about down at the other end of the site either. It's not even 10.30 and we already seem to be opening our first trench. I haven't even finished my tea yet. Francis, yeah. a bit hasty putting a trench in already, isn't it? Well, the thing is, Tony, it's an enormous site and uh, we can't hang around. We've only got three days, so I thought I'd put a trench right across the defences here. Why did you put the trench here? Do you remember that air photo? It very clearly showed something that looked like ramparts precisely here. So 
early this morning, I told John to skip his breakfast and to do some geofizz. How'd it go, John? <sighs> Not very well. Oh. I can't see the hill fort defences at all, mm. to be honest. I mean, you can see all the canes stretching off into the distance, and these are the results. I mean, ignore these speckled there, just stray bits of iron. At best, we've got a sort of trend that follows that line, but I'm not seeing a ditch. And to be honest, when I look in your trench, I can't see a ditch. No, it does all look uniformly brown, Francis. It doesn't look very hopeful, I have to say, Tony, um, at this stage. But, you know, we've got to keep on. We've got to keep on. So what I plan to do is go down a little bit further, see if it's looking ditch-like, right? And then I'll double up the width and we'll go back about 40 metres. 40 metres? Well, there are basically two things we've got to discover, Tony. We've got to get the ditch and then we want to go on the inside because I want to get the very inside of the hill fort, if that's what it is. Oh, and a third thing. Um, we might find some structures on the inside, might we, John? I don't think so. Oh, I've got a slight feeling of doom about this dig. In spite of there being no sign of anything much on John's geofizz, we've opened our first trench here. We're looking for the big ditch and bank we saw on Keith's aerial photo. And as always, we need finds. Pottery, bone, metalwork, anything that might tell us what this was and when it was built. Cool. That's a bit nice. Over at the other end of our site, Phil's checking out the earthwork in the woods. That is a ser serious bank, isn't it? It is, yeah. And you can see the stone right at the top. I mean, and a lot of the work has actually been done for us because this is the bank and this bit here is just a bit of, bit of muck that's fallen down. All we've got to do is, is clear this out of the way. We'll have a nice clean section through the bank itself and just down there will be the old ground surface. Hopefully, yeah, just through there. And of course, this isn't the end of the bank. It's just where it's been cut through to create this track. So the bank would have continued round through here. So presumably, then, the best place to get a section through the ditch is going to be down in here. Because we don't really want to go into the woods, do we? Well, yeah, I and mean, you're just standing to towards, but not at the middle of the ditch there, Phil. So if we run a trench through here... And out through there. through there. Yeah. And then through across to where the bank was, that's the way to do it. Let's have a digger in and get on with it. Hacking away the undergrowth has revealed what an impressive earthwork this must have been. So Phil's going to dig a section through the big bank in the woods here. Out in the field next door, John's team have been investigating what Francis is calling an intriguing mound. Looks more like an unappealing bump to me. It's clearly there on the ground, um, but we've not got an enclosure around it or anything. But what is exciting, at this end of the field, we've got these ditches. Now, could they be internal divisions of the hill fort? Francis, does this geofizz help you decide what we should do next? Um, yes, it does, actually, Tony. OK, so we didn't get much around the mound, um, but I, it's so prominent. Um, I think we've got to dig there. But those ditches over there are really intriguing. I mean, if they are prehistoric, I think we've got to have a go, yes. But what I really want to do now is go back to the ditch in the wood, because what we can see on the surface looks pretty tasty. It does seem as though this site's going to be a bit of a struggle, but there's one big plus. In that wood, there's something that's man-made, it's big, it's not modern, and we don't know what it is. And we've still got two and a half days to find out. This is Dinmore Hill in Herefordshire, and in that wood over there are a bank and ditch which we think might be part of a huge Iron Age fort. That's the good news. The bad news is that the bank and ditch which we think might have been associated with it down there, we can't find. And in this field, frankly, John, the geofizz has been pretty desultory. I think that's fair, don't you? Last time you looked, it's getting better. It's definitely getting better. We still haven't got any joy around the mound that's at that end. But if we look at this end of the field, now we saw ditch lengths earlier. Now we've expanded the survey. The ditches are continuing. And these blobs, they could well be pits. These are the sorts of responses you might get inside the Nine Age hill fort. Yeah, but you might get those in medieval times, well, might you? Yes, you might. Or in the 18th or 19th century. Yes, they, they might even be natural. They could be Victorian. 
for all we know. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't want to be too negative. It's just that, no. Francis, I don't really understand yeah. why you're focusing so much attention on this part of the site when we've got superb archaeology in the woods, and yet you seem obsessed by this dribbly <laughs> stuff. Well, look, Tony, those huge ditches were dug by people for a reason. They just didn't dig them for their good health. You know, this was an important place to them. It was the top of the hill. It was a place where they probably lived. Um, they probably buried their dead here. Those pits were where they stored grain. We'll probably find post-built granaries. There's all sorts of stuff here. This is crucially important. In fact, I would say it was more important than those ditches. So you could say that the only reason the ditches were dug mm -hmm. is because of this part of the site? Absolutely. I've just argued myself totally out of my original position. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Go away. Anytime. <laughs> I do like to be accommodating. Flying in the face of my scepticism, Francis has decided to focus attention on the interior of our site. So we're opening a third trench to investigate one of John's pits. If we are inside a hill fort, Tracy and Faye should find evidence of occupation. Houses and domestic hearths used by the living, graves and burial mounds occupied by the dead. No sign of either yet, but it's early days. Is that going to be the back of the rampart? Yeah, it looks like a rear abetment wall, possibly. The stone underneath there. Back in the woods, we found the first tantalising signs of how this huge bank was constructed. That's nice, isn't it, laid in there? It's classic. This could be really well built. There's that. another one there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this would be an indicator that it might be an Iron Age construction. Not only that, it could be an indicator that this is an entrance. This is great. If this does turn out to be the entrance to an Iron Age hill fort, it'll be an exciting discovery. On the other hand, we shouldn't be surprised. This entire landscape is packed with prehistoric monuments. Some are two and a half thousand years old and Iron Age. Some go further back into the Bronze Age, others earlier still into the Neolithic. But if there's one type of prehistoric monument Herefordshire has in spades, it's Iron Age hill forts, as our historian Bethany Hughes is finding out. There's this classic hill fort territory here. We've got major river valleys cutting through the landscape. We've got the River Lug coming up here, winding its way round the site and up to the north. We've got the River Arrow coming in here. And we've got a number of quite famous hill forts in this area. For instance, we've got Croft Ambre up here, we've got Credden Hill down here, Sutton Walls here. I tell you, the only thing that bothers me, though, is that we know there's Bronze Age activity here. So why are we obsessing about the Iron Age? <laughs> well, why is this not some special Bronze Age site? Yeah, uh, we've got to remember that you know, the world doesn't start with the Iron Age. There's, there's what, these two, 3,000 years going back to, to the Neolithic period but before that. And if something's good in one period, it, going to be potentially good strategically in another period. So we've got to, to some extent, keep an open mind about what might be on here. Well, if there is a hill fort here kind of embraced by the River Lug, it's going to be a pretty enormous one. It is. I mean, that, that's slightly worrying to some extent because I, I've had a look at the area. If, if it is a hill fort, it's going to be 43 acres, which is enormous. Crikey, if this place really is 43 acres, that's twice the size of any of the other hill forts in the area. And that's not the only thing I find baffling. Where have Faye and Tracy gone? Why is there no one in that trench? It was only put in about an hour ago. Yeah, well, they're saying it's natural. I, there's nothing man-made there. But, John, that was where you said that there was going to be pits and ditches. Well, I hoped there would be. I did actually say there's a possibility it's just natural features. Yeah. The geology's making things difficult. It's difficult to see things. That's why we've not seen the big deep ditch, because of all the geology on top. And is that why you've put in this one? Well, this is... I'm even more hopeful about this one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you're you're going to say I'm clutching at straws, but yeah. look at the results now. In amongst all this detail here, can you see that curving arc? I can. Just in case you couldn't, <laughs> there. Now, we've put the trench in there. I'd like to interpret that as a central pit, hearth and part of a roundhouse. They're going to prove me right or wrong. That would be good, wouldn't it? Because if we've got some kind of entrance to our Iron Age hill fort, if that's what it is, and if we've got some kind of bank and ditch, there's got to be some activity in the middle. Yes. And this is the best we've got so far. So we're having another stab at finding signs of life on this hill, 
by putting in a fourth trench here. It's very clean again, isn't it? Yep. I mean, if it is a roundhouse, and John's right about the feature of this end, if it is a half pit or fire pit or something like that, I mean, it should show up fairly clearly. But it didn't show up that clearly for a fire pit, not on the geofoods. It might be painfully slow going up here, but over in Trench 1, we've had our first big breakthrough. Wow, Matt, so it was all colluvium. It all, yes, hidden underneath this. Yeah. There's your ditch, there it is, look. There's the, uh, well, you can see there's the, the grey natural there. There's the line of the edge of the ditch, and then there's the fill of the ditch, the kind of blue-grey silt. Perfect. Better still, our environmental expert, Mike Allen, has got an intriguing find. Oh, look at that. That's oak, isn't it? Yeah, this is oak, and the augering did show that we might have waterlogging at the bottom of this ditch, and indeed we have, and this is, as you can't really say, it's probably oak, but it's also uh, probably a stake, so a wooden stake driven into the ground, and it's now fallen into the ditch. And you've got um, bits of charcoal and all sorts in here. I mean, it's rich, isn't There's it? There's charcoal all over the place. There's bits in here and here. So this is part of the occupation within the, the site or part of the destruction, but that's not all. We have got here other pieces of wood other than the stakes, badly preserved, but for an yeah. upland site... It's magic. ...waterlog wood is almost unprecedented. This is more like it. We've found the giant ditch we saw on Keith's aerial photo and it looks like it may have been defended by a palisade of sharpened stakes on the bank behind it. The archaeology in the woods is beginning to look pretty spectacular too. Wow, that's fantastic, Phil. You've got real stratigraphy there. I know. It's a cracking section. It's a very, very complicated story. You see, I think they've, at the, right at the beginning is this one that's coming over like that and going right the way down there. And you can see what, what they've done, they've really, really carefully built it because they've capped it off with these lovely flat slabs of stone. And I do wonder whether or not that phase may have had a, a palisade at the front, because look at the way these two stones tip in like that. Just wonder whether there may not have been a, some sort of timber palisade there. But then you see, after that, what they've done, they've actually enhanced the, uh, the bank, made it bigger by mm. putting in that rubble there. Mm. And then finally, they've capped it off with all this material that sits on the top. So you've got at least three phases, possibly four. It's a very, very complicated story. Yeah. But the best, if you like, is yet to come, because here's the back of the rampart. Look at these stones tipping down like that. That's the back of the rampart, and there's a, it's separated by this. It's a solid stone wall. Look, we've got these vertical pitch stones there and vertical pitch stones there, and the whole gap in between is filled in with these horizontal packing stones. I mean, for all the world, that looks more like building than rampart, doesn't it? It is crucially important what the site must contain. This is great stuff. Evidence of phases indicates that whoever built this bank came back to reinforce it again and again over some considerable time. More importantly, it looks like there may have been a wooden palisade at this end of the site too. But whether these are two sections of one continuous earthwork that encircled the top of this hill, we don't yet know. Back in Trench 4, there's no sign of John's roundhouse. In fact, there's no sign of anything much at all. And it does make me question, if we don't start to begin to find stuff in here, whether we had any occupation up here at all. Evidence of settlement up here is proving elusive. But it being late July, there's a far bigger problem brewing, the weather. And unfortunately, it's turning out to be a typical British summer. Mmm, lovely. I think it's above and beyond the call of duty for you to keep digging in this rain. It, what is it that's kept you going? It's really exciting, Tony. It looks like we've got a bank up at that end of the trench, and it looks like it actually had some kind of stone lining. Where's if, that? Well, if you look underneath Peter's feet there, can yeah. you see the stones? That's the top of the stones. If you follow the line along, there's some pale clay, and there's another couple of stones there on the edge of the bank. The rest of them have slid all the way down and they're in a pile down at the bottom there. And how long do you think it's going to be before we get to the bottom of the ditch? Well, I thought we were only a couple of inches off the bottom, but Mike did an auger down there and we've got about 40 centimetres to go. 
This has been a really frustrating day. When we started out, we thought we had really good archaeology with the bank and the ditch and the wood, which might spread over to here and then into that far field there. But the more we dug, the less evidence we got. That is, until late this afternoon, when suddenly we realised we didn't have nothing. Actually, we've got a big something. We've got this huge ditch, a big bank. We've got this stone lining. This is really well engineered. But what is it? What's its date? We still don't know. Still, we've got another two days left. Although, according to the weather forecast, the rain's going to get even worse. Beginning of day two here at Dinmore Hill in Herefordshire, and I was right, this site is doomed. I thought the problem would be the archaeology, but in fact it looks like the archaeology is going to be really good. The issue is the weather. It's rotten, 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 rotten. 25 millimetres of rain forecast by 4 o'clock this afternoon. In fact, it's so bad that none of us really knows what to do. We're excavating what we think is an Iron Age hill fort. At least we would be if it wasn't pelting down. Well, that looks a bit dodgy, Matt, doesn't it? It's not as full of water as I actually thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be a swimming pool. It's the sliding which is going to be the problem, isn't it? Yeah, think. and you're also going to... There's a danger of a mudslide, too. I don't think we could possibly put people down there. So I'm afraid we'll just have to close this down for the time being and um, call it a day. Right, hey. Sorry about that, folks. Yeah, there it is. Back home. But even if work's ground to a halt here, at least the woods provide some cover down at the other end of our site, aided by this state-of-the-art weatherproofing kit brought in at huge expense. <laughs> Where do you get this stuff from? Some local car boot sale or something? <laughs> Look, look at this here. I'll tell you what, the longer you stand farting around with it, the more it's going to break. Well, let's put it over the trench then. Well, uh, you do your second best thing, stop talking. Well, no, no, I'm directing. Pitching a tent in the rain's bad enough, but at least it's better than having to do geofizz. This is ridiculous. I mean, well ventilated. Well, it's well ventilated. And we got some light, that's the main thing, and we, we are dry. This will be a good place to work. Are we going to be able to dig here all right today? You're too right, we are. Rather lit work in here than out there. <laughs> but the problem is the ground slopes that way. Isn't it all going to run into the archaeology? Well, considerate of you to mention that, but... Uh, <laughs> we have it, ways of dealing it, with that. Yes, yeah, at least we'll be dry. Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> They've no idea how they're going to dig today. I've got no idea at all. What have, you, what have you got here? We've got the most amazing bank. I mean, it is a superb thing. Look at it. You can see it's not just built in one phase. It's a series of events where people have actually made this thing bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and stronger in defence. The wonderful thing about it, too, is that we've got this wall, stub end of a wall, coming out. What does that tell you, Francis? Well, I think that could be what they called in Victorian days a guardhouse. They're very characteristic of hill forts in this part of the world. Basically, it's a sort of semicircular building just inside the entranceway. And for all the world, that looks like, to me, a guardhouse, in which case we are in an entranceway into the hill fort. And then the other thing that we do have here also is the ditch. We want to get a complete section through the ditch because if we can demonstrate that the construction of this ditch is the same or different, to what Matt has got, it will help us to understand whether we're dealing with one site or two sites. And that's our problem. At the moment, we've got two bits of unconnected archaeology. The big earth bank in the woods here, and the ditch down at the other end of our site. The question is, are they part of one big monument? To find out, Phil's extending his trench to excavate the ditch. We've done this before. My last lesson's on Friday. If both sections of earthwork are constructed in the same way, then most of our archaeologists think we've got one big enclosure, and more than likely, a giant Iron Age hill fort. 
Most, that is, apart from Stuart, who, as usual, doesn't agree with anyone. In fact, he's now found something exciting in the woods, and he's keen to show it to Bethany. We've all heard that one before. Down here, so we're still walking along the top of the bank, and it starts to get quite interesting when we get just to this dip over here. As you can see, we're starting to, to drop down very rapidly. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's a nice, flat area. There's no sign of that bank whatsoever. But when I get to here... I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll just stay down here. You can, <laughs> you can go and investigate out there. You see, I'm back up on top of the bank again. I can see it heading off that way, big ditch outside it. The bank starts again. So what we've got here is a very genuine gap. It's not the sort of thing that you get where a, a tractor's bust through or anything like that modern. Yeah. I think this is a genuine entrance through this big bank and ditch here. Well, it does raise the possibility now, of course, that if this earthwork is not one long thing, but it's composed of a series of sections with more than one entrance, and if what they've got over there is an entrance, then that may push it further and further in back in time because you get um, boundary monuments which are built in sections. So we have the possibility that we've got a monument that sort of starts here in the, perhaps even the Neolithic period, continues right through in use, and, and this is still here today. I'm so glad you brought me here. So we've narrowed it down. Something's going on. It could have been a 1,000 years ago. It could have been 2,500. It could have been 3,500 years ago. Great. Good stuff, Stuart. <laughs> if this earthwork isn't continuous but has a series of gaps through it, Stuart suspects it could be several thousand years older than the rest of us think. To resolve that one way or another, we need datable finds. Frustratingly, that's one thing we haven't seen at all on this site until now. Faye, mm -hmm. look what I've got here. Charcoal. Oh. Masses and masses of it. I've started to collect it. Look at that. Ooh. Black as your hat. Lovely, lovely charcoal. And it's not just the fact that it's charcoal. Look, it's where it comes from. Look, there's the charcoal, mm -hmm. and there is the bottom of the ditch. Oh, I think that is. You think you're right, yeah. So it means that that charcoal was dropped in the bottom of the ditch pretty soon after it was dug. Mm -hmm. So that should give us a date, basically, for the bottom of the ditch. Absolutely. It's just been the most crucial thing we wanted to try and find out. When was this ditch dug? We were hoping, hoping, and who knows, we might still get some pottery. But in the absence of pottery... <laughs> <laughs> This charcoal should allow us to radiocarbon date Phil's ditch. It's a big breakthrough, even if what this extremely puzzling place was remains a mystery. Virtually all our archaeologists are absolutely convinced that what we've got up there is an Iron Age hill fort. And not just any old Iron Age hill fort, but a massive one, one of the size of somewhere like Maiden Castle. So, obviously... <laughs> They're pretty excited about that, but on time team, there's always a fly in the ointment and he's sitting over there behind <laughs> that table. <laughs> Stuart, what's this I hear that you're questioning the notion <laughs> that what we've got is a hill fort? When you start to look at the physical evidence that we've got, it, it, it's very interesting. Now, this is where Phil's digging just here. We can see the bank and ditch. It comes through the woodland down there. It's very well preserved, but no evidence at all of it coming round here, as you would expect with Iron Age hill forts. It doesn't happen here. And when you look at all hill forts, they've all got continuity of defences around circuits. That's a very common thing. Absolutely no evidence that's ever occurred at all. What do you think it is? Well, what we've got, I think, coming across here, first of all, is something called a crossridge dike. Now, this is a, a sort of land boundary. This is Iron Age? Well, they can be used in the Iron Age. They often actually predate the Iron Age. It can be Bronze Age in date and continue to be used through into the Iron Age and even beyond that as boundaries. But what about all this archaeology here? Well, that, that is interesting because, uh, again, just if you, if you look at this aerial photograph here, this is where Phil's digging trench there. We've got what appears to be a cross ridge dike which comes down here, which goes across the ridge. The postulation was that that was one large hill fort coming all the way around here. There's no evidence these features come back along here. If you look at the aerial photograph closely, can you see that bank and ditch, which was extant in 1946 when this photograph was taken, actually turns a corner and comes back round here. There's absolutely no evidence it continued towards the escarpment edge there. Have you told the others yet? Not yet. <laughs> you can do that for Can't me if you wait like. For that. <laughs> 
Stuart seems determined to blow our Iron Age hill fort theory out of the water. He thinks the ditch in Matt's trench doesn't carry on to complete a full circuit of this hilltop, but turns back on itself and could be a small Iron Age farm. And he's convinced the earthwork Phil's excavating is a cross-ridge dike built 2,000 years earlier in the Bronze Age. If he's right, we could have two completely separate bits of archaeology built at two completely different periods in prehistory. Oh dear. We may be splitting into opposing factions, but at least Phil's happy. He thinks his ditch is one of the most impressive bits of prehistoric archaeology he's ever seen. What is it that's so wonderful about this trench, then? It's just the sheer scale of being in the bottom of this ditch, and you really have to get into the bottom of it just to appreciate just how big it is. Look, when you cast your eye up there, look at the top of the rampart. Yeah. Think about it, a lot of this material that's in this ditch would have come from the top of that rampart. Just think of the scale of it. And this was all cut by hand? Absolutely, Tony. It all cut through this solid rock, just using people with their bare hands and, and literally uh, iron tools and picks. I mean, it's taken us half a day to do this with a machine. Just think how much longer it would have taken to do it by hand. How long do you reckon it is in either direction? In either direction, about 300 metres, so it's at 600 metres overall. And the interesting thing is it looks as though we've probably got the entrance here. This massive ditch is not something we expected to find, is it? No, but, I mean, it is, it is just a privilege and a pleasure to be able to dig it and stand in it. It's astonishing to think that an army of people must have hacked this 600-metre earthwork out of the solid rock using brute force alone. Out on sight, the chaos continues. Francis, this is madness. You closed that trench down this morning because it's raining so much, but you've stuck in another one. Well, the thing is, Tony, we can't just stop. We've only got three days, and I'm not having people digging these trenches. Uh, it was just being done by a machine, so there was no health and safety problems. I actually extended that other trench over there because there's a flat bit behind the bank, and that's where normally you'd expect to find houses. We didn't find any, so I then came over here, but this is a rather flat area. You can see we're in a natural hollow, and this, again, is where you'd expect to have houses, because you're protected from the winds blowing over there. And have you found anything? Nothing. Absolutely not a sausage. So are you going to keep on digging more trenches, or are you going to stop and think now? Uh, I'm going to stop and think and have a bath, I think. It's the end of day two. We've dug here, here and here, but we've failed to find any evidence of people living on this hill. And yet we've got two giant earthworks. This place is still a total enigma. So despite the rain, we've hit two magnificent ditches, Matt's and Phil's. But of course, we still don't know whether or not they're linked, but you think they are. I do, Tony. I mean, they're so similar, both the ditches. I mean, the filling's similar and the sizes and the depth, so I think they are the same. <laughs> You're shaking your head, Stuart. Yeah, I disagree with that. I think we've got two distinctly separate monuments. One that goes right the way across the ridge, the one we've got here, uh, but over in the field where Matt is, I think we've got good evidence that it's a distinctly separate monument. What fascinates me about this ditch, though, is the amount of work that must have gone into it. How many people do you think it would have taken to build the whole thing? Oh, a lot of people, Tony. Hundreds, maybe even thousands. So why are there no signs of life at all on the entire site? Well, that's a good question, Tony, but we've just discovered that here there was a probable entranceway into the interior of the hill fort. Now, we know from other hill forts, but just inside the entranceway, and that would put us over there, in the other field, that's where you have most of the buildings and most of the evidence for people. So I think tomorrow morning that's where we start digging first thing. It's been a quite extraordinary day, even though we have had so much rain. And one of the most extraordinary things is that the weather forecast said the rain would stop at six, and I think it stopped dead on six. <laughs> and they say that tomorrow is going to be much better and maybe not any rain at all. See, it's not raining. The weatherman actually got it right. And if that isn't enough cause for celebration, take a look at that trench. You see the side of that ditch, all made of rock, all cut by hand. 
It's got to be one of the most dramatic pieces of prehistoric archaeology that we've ever found. And hopefully we're going to be able to date it later on today. And if we can't date the ditch, then we may be able to date that ramparty thing behind it. And in addition, you see these stones here. They could be part of some kind of building which is tucked in behind that mound. So we're going to extend this trench and have a closer look at that. And over here on the other side of the site, things are also looking pretty good. We had to close down all the archaeology in this field yesterday for health and safety reasons. But, Matt, presumably now it's full steam ahead. It is. I mean, it's not in a very good state at the moment, though. I mean, you can see all the water in there, and not just that, but the collapse shows how dangerous these trenches do get in the rain. But, I mean, the weather's turned now, so we can get going, but still got a lot to do. So when you say it's full steam ahead, it isn't full steam ahead? Not quite yet. Not really, Tony, no. We've got to make this trench safe. So I'm going to get Ian in with the big digger, and we're going to batter the sides back. You know, there are going to be people working right at the bottom now. We must get it right. Fair enough. Before we can start digging again, we need to clean out and secure our trenches. the earthwork in the woods, there are still no finds. But soil scientist Mike Allen is in his element. This may look like a pile of mud to you and me, but Mike can read it like a book. What we do have is about this horizon here, a nice intact in situ soil. This is the land surface on which people would have walked. So this isn't a woodland soil. So we know, therefore, it must be after the woodlands have been cut down and the landscape opened. So it, this dates to after the early Bronze Age. I've also said this hasn't been ploughed, and we know this landscape was ploughed very intensively in the medieval period. So it has to be pre-medieval, OK? Not a good date. Pre-medieval, post-early Bronze Age, over to you. So basically that gives us a window of, like, I don't know, two and a half thousand years. <laughs> It's better than you had before. Well, uh, no, 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 we, we, we'll definitely try and refine that. Nice try, Mike. So we're still struggling to date this earthwork, and we still don't understand how it fits into the story of this place. Though Stuart has a theory of his own. Here's our site, here's the river lug coming, coming round here. Now, at the northwest of this bit of high ground, there's a, a, an Iron Age hill fort called Ivington Camp. This has got lots of banks and ditches around it. It's sort of classic hill fort in every respect to the word. But on the opposite side of the River Lug, there's Risbury, another hill fort, again with classic bank and ditch round it. And this finger of land that comes down from here points into this territory over here. This is the point of contact between them. It's almost like a gateway between what's going on over here in the Iron Age and what's going on over here. So I suppose, in a way, this, this whole place is like a kind of formal entrance from one world into another. I think the whole thing is... That's a brilliant way to put it. The whole thing is the entrance to the landscape of Ivington Camp. Surprise, surprise! Stuart and Bethany have arrived at a completely different interpretation of our site. They think Dinmore Hill was crossed by a pair of dikes, making the whole hill a formal point of contact between two hill fort territories centred round Ivington Camp and Risbury. Out on sight, Francis is determined to prove otherwise. He's opening Trench 6 to try and find the continuation of the earthwork. If it's here, it should line up with the big ditch and bank in Phil's trench. Back in the incident room, Mike's poring over the remains of this wooden stake from Trench 1. Painstaking microscopic work like this tells us as much about this site as the big archaeology does. This is almost definitely oak. It's a branch or a stave that's been selected from woodland specifically to make a fence post or a rail of some kind. Now, how can you tell that's been specifically selected? Because we can see that it's a nice round piece of wood. Yeah. And so they've gone into the woodland and selected pieces very carefully, which are nice and straight and round for building or fencing. And that has lots of other really quite subtle and interesting implications. Like what? Like, if they're doing that, they're probably managing the woodland. The woodland isn't just a load of trees, it's a resource which they are using and utilising. So from this little piece of wood, we can suggest there's quite a complex, organised society somewhere out there managing the woodland for construction. If Mike's right, the people who built the earthwork were also coppicing trees to produce wood for fencing and cutting back trunks for bigger timbers. 
Back on site, there's no sign that the earthwork continued through our new trench. Phil's face says it all. This place is proving such a tough nut to crack. Time to step back and have a rethink. The big question that's really puzzling everybody is, do we have a huge Iron Age hill fort that starts around about here somewhere and goes right through into the woods? Or do we have two entirely separate pieces of archaeology? How do we resolve that? Well, we get geophysics to work all the way over this field and see what clues they come up with, which we've already done. Looks pretty interesting, doesn't it? Except that this interesting looking big line here is a much later trackway that appears on the tide map, so that's no use to us. And these intriguing lines here are all natural geology. So really, there are no clues here at all. So we've got less than a day left and a massive question that's entirely unresolved. Francis, you're the leader of the Pro Hill Fort faction, yeah. aren't you? Well, I am, Tony, because I like simple explanations. There are hundreds of hill forts in Britain and they have large ditches, they have high banks, and we've got large ditches and we've got high banks. We've got them over in the wood and we've got a ditch over here which we don't yet fully understand. Yes, he's right. We have got a very big bank and ditch over there and we've got a ditch evidence over here. What we haven't got is the connection between the two round the top of the hill, which is usually how you define a hilltop enclosure, a hill fort. But the people who were constructing that bank and ditch over there were doing so with the same care and the same oh, complexity yes. Yes, as they yes. did with something else. And so right. I don't think it, it's just a dike. Mm. I'm glad we're all agreed on that then. But while the bickering continues, our resident geophysicist is waiting in the wings with a big smile on his face. I thought you were just watching the scene, but actually you had an ulterior motive, didn't you? Yeah, well, that's the plot you were looking at. We hadn't surveyed this area, and that's where Francis wanted the ditch to extend through. But look, we've now done it. You see this clear line, even with the possible entrance at that point. So we've got the ditch? Well, I hope so. I mean, the only problem is the reason we hadn't done it is the sound aerials are actually at that point there. It's just possible it's an effect of those. So we're going to have to move the aerials? I think, really, we need to. Steve, come here. You're the sound man. Can we move your aerial? Well, of course. <laughs> That's all right, then. <laughs> the archaeological stalemate has been broken thanks to John, who thinks he's found the continuation of Matt's ditch along with another possible entrance here. Digging it should resolve what this place was, one way or the other. Meanwhile, Stuart's grand focal point of contact between two hill forts theory is about to come tumbling down. Flatter areas are in red, running through to the steep areas, which are blue, so that's each side of our hill. Um, now, this is where Phil's been digging, mm -hmm. and you can see the bank running through there. Yeah, I can see it really clearly. I'll get to a yeah, slope on yeah. the side. You can also see it continuing down through here as well. So you've, you've got where, where Matt's, Matt's trench is, across mm -hmm. here. And you can see, actually, that ditch features running right through here. Is there anything that suggests the two are actually physically linked together? That's a really tantalising question, Stuart, because if you look here, we've got the bank and ditch, which Phil's been working. Here's where Matt's one should come in. Now, between the two, can you see this pale blue line? Mm. Now, that is an area which is slightly flatter. I think they're terracing this area. you make it artificially steeper. Mm -hmm. So what we have is an earthwork. It changes form into this terrace and then becomes a bank and ditch again going around. So it looks like we have an enclosure. So maybe it is continuous. Mm -hmm. So when we've got nothing absolutely concrete that they all join together yet, have we? No, I, I, I feel confident. Yeah. <laughs> it is complex, isn't it? There's nothing simple about this hill time. No, not at all. This is a big step forward and a pie in the face for Stuart. Henry's convinced that the sides of our hill have been deliberately cut back to make the escarpments harder to climb. So that means we haven't got two separate sites. It's far more likely one giant earthwork encircled this entire hilltop. So it's all down to our final trench to find the missing piece in the puzzle. Found it yet, Matt? Oh, hi, John. Ian, hold on a sec. Um, well, I think we're just getting to the top of the natural there. Can you see the grey? Can you show, yeah. show exactly where we are, then? We've put the trench in and what we think is the break, the entrance here. Mm. This has to be a ditch. Whether it's Iron Age or not, that's up to you. Mm. If we can complete the circuit, we'll have proved beyond reasonable doubt this was an Iron Age hill fort. With just five minutes left, we haven't got long. 
really. The issue is whether this is actual, real edge. Uh, it could be. There no. Was... no, it's not. Is it collapsed? Oh, hang on. No, that is. Is that hard? That's real. OK. That's it. That's the edge there. It's six yeah. o'clock. It it's really been tough, wet and muddy, but our time's up. Oh, you got something. Yeah, well, the geophysics showed this huge ditch coming along here yeah. with a break in it just in front of me. And that's what we've got. I'm standing in the terminus of it here at the end, and you can see it's massive cut straight through the bedrock. Do you think that this ditch aligns with the other ditch that you were digging down there yesterday? Yeah, it does. We've clearly got it in the geophysics going straight through this field and then curving off around there. Francis, it's been a sight all about ditches. It has, Tony, and what? ditches. I mean, over there in the wood, that sensational deep ditch and the bank that went with it, typically Iron Age, and the way that all the ditches we've looked at are subtly different suggests to me that they were probably dug by different groups of people who came to this area as a sort of central meeting place. Think of it as a sort of Iron Age Stonehenge. It's where people came to meet. Fine, Keith. Well, that's the remarkable thing now, Tony. We are beginning to turn up finds, not lumps of pottery indicating permanent occupation, but evidence of feasting. What we've got here is an antler and attached skull from a red deer. At last, we've got confirmation of a single giant earthwork. But this was no ordinary hill fort. A radiocarbon date from our final trench indicates that its earliest phase was built 3,000 years ago in the Late Bronze Age. So although Stuart's vision of a cross-ridge dike wasn't right, his instincts were spot on. We think the western section was reinforced a 1,000 years later in the Iron Age to form a grand entrance, the gateway into a giant assembly area where surrounding communities gathered to perform religious rites, and celebrate seasonal festivals. But it would be willful not to make one last visit to our fantastic ditch, which I reckon must be the best piece of Iron Age archaeology that we've ever excavated on Time Team. Phil, great piece of engineering. It is an incredible piece of engineering, Tony. And remember, this trench here is only a fragment of the entire ditch that goes around the hill. But why? is one side of it virtually vertical and that side slanting. It is the ultimate defensive weapon. I can climb down there relatively easily, but when I get here, I'm met by this vertical, sheer rock face. And if there are people up there hurling rocks at you, you are not going to get out of here. You know, that rock was worked on by hundreds of people over hundreds of hours using metal tools. Might not seem to us as dramatic as swords and shields, but 2,000 years ago, that would have been a really powerful statement in the landscape by an Iron Age tribe saying, we are here. <laughs>